Hey, Ruby. Abigail, great to see you guys today. Here everybody comes. All right. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? See? Yes? All right, wonderful. I hope you all had a great week and a terrific weekend. Remember, since we have classes on Mon on Tuesdays, you do have lessons to do on Monday. So you have lessons to do every day that we don't have a live class. You guys are doing great. Most of you are doing terrific with keeping up with the due dates. I think that's really helpful when you do that. Anybody have any questions about what you did last week or anything that um, you want to know more about? Nope. No questions from Bastion. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, can everybody see where it says right there? Yes? Somebody needs to nod or, yeah, good. All right, thank you, thank you. Always make sure that you can see that slide when we get started. Let me know if you ever cannot. Okay, so um, went ahead in the, so somebody just asked me, is it okay that I went ahead in the homework? And the answer to that is yes. That's why I post things at least two weeks at a time so that you can work ahead if you want to. It's fine to work ahead. I don't suggest working behind, but like if you know that you've got a vacation coming up, or you know, you're in a play or you've got some kind of competition that you're gonna need to spend a lot of time, work ahead in your science work. That way you can take time off without falling behind. So yes, it's always fine to work ahead. And if you're ever far enough ahead that you go beyond what I've done, let me know. It might be possible for me to open up even a little bit farther. Like if you know you're gonna be gone for three weeks or something like that. Okay, so today we are going to talk about cells. So tell me what you already know. Tell me some things about cells. What do you think of when you hear the word cell? Micah. Oh, you're muted, Micah. Um, oh, There, I asked you to unmute. Maybe that'll do it. All right, you're not muted anymore. Go ahead, Micah. No, still can't hear you. All right, we'll move on. Bastion. Um, don't cells make up all all matter? Not matter, but all living matter. Cells yeah. make up all living things. So atoms are what makes up matter. So like cells don't make up things like rocks and oxygen. Right? They're made up of atoms, but it makes up all living things. So yeah, uh, Jaslyn says every living organism is made of cells. You got it. Abigail, you got another one? There are a lot of different kinds of cells. There are a lot of different kinds of cells. And we'll learn about some of those, some of those kinds of cells today. All right, so we are made of cells. Living things are made of cells. Cells are the smallest part, what we call unit of an organism that is alive. So an organism is a living thing. Cells are the smallest part of a living thing that are alive. And we have a lot of them. We have about somewhere between 30 and 100 trillion, depending on what resource you look at. So I want you to imagine this. Imagine that you live in a town that has a million people in it. And every one of those million people has a million dollars. That's a trillion. <laughs> That's one trillion. Now, I know some of you guys live on the, on the West Coast. Imagine if all of the people that lived in California each had a million dollars. That's still only about 39 trillion. And we have somewhere between 35 and 100 trillion cells. So that gives you an idea just how big 100 trillion is and how many there are. Um, so Jaslyn says cells are considered of several different kinds of organelles. Uh, consisted, yes. 
Yes, they do. And we'll talk about the organelles today too. And uh, you talked about the last week, if you read, or a lot, yesterday, if you kept up with the due dates. First though, before we go into talking more about cells, I want to tell you a couple of bits of important information. So we'll have to do this for the beginning, couple of lessons until we're all up to speed and all on the same page. I just want to give you guys a reminder when you send me a Canvas inbox message, please give me lots of detail. Give me the name of the lesson you're asking about, the question number you're asking about, and lots of detail. The more detail you can give me, even sending me screenshots uh, is helpful. So the more detail you can give me, the faster I can help you. All right. I need to make sure everybody's paying attention because this is really, really important. Do not use grades to find assignments. I'm going to show you what I mean. So I'm going to drag in. A, this is a fake student account right here. See over here where it says grades? If you click where it says grades, you'll get a list of things like this. Now, this is all missing because this is, like I said, a fake student account that I just set up. Don't work your way down this list. There might be some things that are missing from this list. And there might be some things on this list that I just haven't deleted yet. So if you're not supposed to use grades to find out what you're supposed to do, what do you do? Well, there's two ways. One is clicking where it says modules over here on the left, right above grades is modules. And that will take you to this list. You can collapse them all. So you can just see the chapter names or you can expand them all. So you see all of the lessons. Start at the top and work your way down. It'll tell you over here if you've done the work or not. Another way that you can get to your lessons is by clicking right here, this little newspaper that says, click above for daily assignments. Just click that, it'll take you to that same exact page. Now, when you look at grades, that only shows you lessons that have a point value that are graded. But I've got some lessons that don't have a point value and you still need to do them. They're important. And you'll skip them if you're going by grades. So please make sure that you're only using either the modules tab or the assignments icon on the homepage. All right. Another thing I want to show you is called the meeting summary. So you guys will, um, hopefully you have seen, let me pull it back up again. Hopefully you'll have seen on the homepage right here where it says click above for class recordings. Right there, that little icon, a little rocket ship in AIM Academy. If you click on that, that takes you to the recordings of these live classes. So if you ever miss one, you can go in there and see your recording. You guys are the Tuesday section. So you'll see right there, that was our first class. That was our second class. Right underneath our second class there and underneath all of them going forward, there will be this meeting summary. You can click that and it takes you to an AI generated summary of our class. So it starts out with a quick recap. It gives some steps there and then it, it breaks things down into headings. And you can, it, like if you say, oh, I know we talked about the scientific method, but I can't remember something that we said, you can quickly look for that there. And then that'll help you also to, um, to, to answer any questions that you have about that. Now, notice here at the bottom, AI generated content may be inaccurate or misleading. That's true. Don't believe everything that you read in an AI generated report. It does the best that it can, but it's not a person who's thinking and trying to figure things out. There may be some errors. One error right now is that it calls me a, a he. Doctor discussed the process of conducting experiments. He explained the importance. Uh, you know, that's just what AI does. So there's one error that you can see, but there may be more. So don't necessarily believe everything that you've seen, but I think that's a pretty cool way to be able to just get a quick review of what we did in the class. All right, those will always be there, like I said. All right, next, when you are doing a discussion board assignment, make sure that you always put your image in and not a link. So we're gonna use discussion boards a lot. I think they're a good way for you guys to interact with one another. And it's really nice when you put an image in and sometimes it's required. And most of you are doing really well, but please make sure that when you put an image in the lesson, you go back out and then come back in to that discussion board and look at it and see. If what you're seeing is just text with a you know blue text that's a link, you gotta redo it. You didn't upload your image. There's a lesson in the course information module 
with instructions. Please make sure that you follow those instructions and double check after you're done because all students can see pictures, but not everybody has the ability to click on all the links. And when you click on a link, you have to download it to your computer. Not everybody's computer will do that. Okay. All right. Anybody have any questions about any of the information? All right. Time for some jokes then. All right. Here's our first joke or riddle or whatever, <laughs> whatever we want to call them. So did you know there's a species of antelope capable of jumping? <laughs> yeah. You like that? Jasmine says it's the best part of the lesson. <laughs> Well, all right. <laughs> Did you know that there's a species of antelope capable of jumping higher than the average house? This is due to its powerful hind legs and the fact that the average house cannot jump. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. But first, yeah, that's spelled wrong, isn't it? Don't worry. I did it on porpoise. <laughs> Here's one. How do you wrap a present for a cloud? With a rainbow. Here's for the musicians among you. What do you call a pod of musical whales? Musical whales. An orchestra. <laughs> All right, I tried to catch some fog, but I missed. And we've talked about the scientific method, how you, know, you have a question and you do an experiment and you come to a conclusion. Well, here's a cute one. Who's a good boy? The dog runs some experiments. The results are in, it's me. And since we're gonna be doing uh, some talking about cells today, I thought you might like to have some cell jokes. So what is a biologist's favorite thing to do? Take selfies. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Thanks for your, your feedback here. All right. How did the nucleus communicate with the cell membrane? It used a cell phone. Look at that. It's got all the organelles in there, the nucleus drawn in there. Somebody had fun drawing that one. And what did the science teacher say to the students in her class? If the cell in your hand does not contain cytoplasm, please put it away. <laughs> All right, let's do a little get acquainted. So remember last week we had some questions and you gave me some answers to your questions. So we're gonna do that again. Type your answers in the chat box and um, you can give one or two or three word answers. Just don't make them too long because it takes too long to, to, to type them out. Okay, your first question is, what crazy activity do you dream of trying someday? Skydiving. Yeah, Madison, that's mine too. I want to skydive. My brother's done it and loved it. May, making a makeup and clothing brand. Wow, that's awesome. Indoor skydiving. Bungee jumping. Cora, you know why I don't want to bungee jump? I don't want to bungee jump because I'm afraid the rope will be about this much too long and I'll hit <laughs> over and over and over. <laughs> of course, that doesn't happen. They make sure that doesn't happen. Evie wants to make a clothing brand too. Wow, you guys are you guys are very uh, motivated here. All right, let's see. Diving from 50 feet, drawing for a movie, making a slingshot. Well, that's not, that's, a, I mean, not many people make those anymore. Swimming with dolphins, extreme ironing. <laughs> All right, Courtney, I have to know what extreme ironing is. Where's Courtney? There you are. All right, I think we have, hold on a second here. All right, hold on. Give me one second, everybody. Sorry. Okay. All right. Let's go. All right. Making a video video game with a video game company and skydiving. Bastion, good. 
free range horse riding. All right, so let me see here just a second here. All right, Paul, I'm gonna change your name, okay? Because I know I knew it wasn't Courtney. Let me change it to Paul. It'll change back when you uh, when you go out. All right, Paul. So Paul gave us the answer, extreme ironing. <laughs> Do you want to tell us what that means, Paul? You don't have to. That's okay. All right. Here's everybody. Here's your next question. Oh, will, will you iron while skydiving? <laughs> okay. Well, interesting. All right. Next question is, what two things do you consider yourself to be very good at? What are you very good at? Singing and acting? Reading, drawing and writing? Got some creativity here. Drawing and running, fencing and puppy training. All right, so when you see that direct message, that means you just sent it to me. So nobody else can see it but me. All right, music and history reenacting, making music and drawing. I love the creativity. Fencing and playing Warhammer, climbing chess and making video games. That's three, Bastion. <laughs> singing, piano. And also singing, making pixel art. Cool, cool. Imagining stuff, music and acting, story writing. I love it. All right, of course, the next obvious question is, what two things do you consider yourself to be very bad at? Very bad at drawing, sports, mm. cooking and singing. I'm not the best cook either, Ruby. I tend to burn things. <laughs> I burn a lot when I cook. My fire alarm, smoke alarm, I guess, goes off a lot. That's okay. There's other things in life. Math, a lot of cooking here. A lot of people aren't great at cooking. Mashed potatoes one time and dumped a whole... Oh, no, Madison. That went right in the trash. <laughs> whole thing they of pepper. Were black. They were black. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure nobody wanted to eat those. Even somebody who loves pepper would be overwhelmed by that. All right, next question. What is your favorite magical or mythological creature? Fairy, dragon. I think dragon is mine too. I'd love to climb on a dragon's back and fly. Unicorn, griffin. Excellent. Hippogriff, ah, Harry Potter fan. Love Harry Potter. A dragon, Pegasus. Bastion. All right, now your middle For name. For everybody here, back. my middle oh, name is Griffin. Name? Yeah, Griffin's my middle name. That's cool. Unicorns or alicorns. Gremlin, phoenix. Rise from the ashes. Phoenix are known for, you know, if, if, if you're kind of a person who can, who can uh, overcome adversity and rise up from the ashes, you're sometimes known as being like a phoenix. That's kind of cool. Trolls. All right, great answer. All right, let's do one more. If you had your human body, but the head of an animal, what animal would you pick? You'd pick yourself? <laughs> Let's say other than a human. Other than a human. Fish, cat, lion or wolf. Any amphibian. A wolf. A horse. Bunny. Aw, cute little bunny. That's interesting. A monkey. Imagine a fly face. Oh, Micah. <laughs> yeah, that's a little, little scary. Salamander. A Doberman. All right. Excellent answers, everybody. Great job. All right. Let's move on to some actual science now. So um, answer this question. Why do you think it's important to learn about cells? What's the point? Abigail. Without cells, there's no room. There's no what? Human. I'm sorry, I'm still not hearing your, your word. Human. There's no human without cells. No human. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, because you learn about you. Good, Cora. Yeah, so imagine 
if you were a person whose job it was to build homes, but you didn't know anything about wood or bricks or metal. You know, imagine if you were a video game designer who didn't know anything about electronics, or if you were one of those people who wants to, you know, design a clothing line, but you don't know anything about fabric. Imagine that. When we know about what we're working with, we can work a lot better. How much better will we understand ourselves if we know what we're made of? So you guys in your lifetime, you're gonna have to be part of some really important decisions like should we grow organs for humans inside other animals? If we have the ability to grow say a human heart inside a pig, should we do that? Well, you need to know about cells and genetics in order to be able to answer that kind of question. You need to have some ethics too, but that's a little outside of what we're doing right now. What if you knew that we could grow a kind of rice that was really high in a vitamin that prevented blindness? And blindness is a big problem in some foreign countries where they don't have enough of this vitamin. What if we could grow corn that did that? You need to understand how a cell works and how genetics works in order to be able to answer whether or not we should do that. So we're made up of a lot of cells. Remember I told you that it's somewhere around um, between 30 and 100 trillion, depending on what you look. Well, this is in general what we're talking about. Now, obviously a baby, a newborn is gonna have a lot fewer cells than an adult is gonna have. But estimates somehow range from about 26 billion in a newborn to about 37, we'll go with that, 37 trillion cells in an adult. Now, about 80% of all the cells in your body are one specific kind of cell. Anybody have a guess what kind of cell is the most prevalent? Eight out of every 10 cells in your body are, are this kind of cell. Micah. Red blood cells? Yeah, red blood cells. You have lots and lots of them and they're very, very tiny and they only live for about three or four months. They're, they're very interesting. In the second semester, when we learn about human biology, we'll talk a lot about red blood cells. The red blood cells are the ones in your arteries and your veins that carry oxygen and nutrients to your cells and carry the waste products away from your cells. So they're very important. All right, so we've got all these cells and we know a lot about them. We know a lot of different kinds of cells. You guys already know a lot about cells, but how do we know that? How do we have any idea about these cells? After all, you can't see them. So how do we know about living cells? What kind of invention do you think made it possible for us to learn about cells? Yeah, I got a couple answers there. Microscopes, microscopes. So this was what the first microscope looked like. So we know about cells because in about the 1500s, people realized that by putting two of these lenses, like I've got two lenses in my glasses, if I put two of them together, overlap them, I can see things that are really, really small. And they learned that by making those lenses specially made with different kinds of curvatures, they could see really, really small things. Now, one of the very first scientists to use a microscope to study things was this guy. His name is Robert Hooke, and he took some cork. You all know what cork is? Like bulletin boards are sometimes made of cork. You see corks down in some bottles. So he took a piece of cork. He does, it's, it's, remember it's a drawing. This is the 1600s. So people had to sit and pose for a long time for a painting to be made. He probably was tired. But yeah, he took this cork, he sliced it really thin and he looked at it under a microscope. And this is what he saw. He saw these little squares and they actually reminded him a lot of the rooms in a monastery. And those rooms in a monastery were called cells. So he called these things cells. He was the first one to call a living, this living structure inside the cork cells. Now, other scientists kept doing work. They kept doing more and more work. They kept um, developing stronger and stronger microscopes. Eventually, they discovered that all plants and all animals and all living things are made up of cells. Now today, we know that all living things are made of at least one. Some are made of more than one, but they're all made of at least one. 
And we say cells are the basic structural unit of living things. Hopefully you'll know what's going on here. Um, Bastion and Jaslyn, are you guys bored? Is that why you're yawning? <laughs> hopefully, hopefully you're not bored already. Class just started. <laughs> no, you're not like the guy who was like, Oh, yeah, he was bored. Well, how about this guy? He looks a little more awake. <laughs> His name is Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek. Look at that last name. It's pronounced Leeuwenhoek. He so he built his own like... microscope. Uh, sorry, what, Bastion? So he looks wide awake. He's like... Yeah, he does look wide awake. <laughs> so he read Robert Hooke's book. And then he built his own microscope based on what he read in the book. And he started looking at really, really tiny things. He's the first person who saw bacteria. Now, bacteria, there's one right here. These are organisms that are made of just one cell. So they're, they're called unicellular organisms. Some other kinds of organisms that are just made of one cell are yeast. Yeast are kind of a fungus, a fungi that are, you, you use yeast when you make bread. They're just one cell. Amoebas are pretty cool. They kind of like slosh around. We'll, we'll talk about amoebas later, but they're also made of one cell. Now, there's also organisms that are made of more than one cell. So if unicellular organisms are made of one cell, multicellular are going to be made of two cells. And there are some examples of multicellular. Animals and plants are multicellular. And then um, bacteria, amoeba, some of the other thing, the things that we talked about are, yeah, like bacteria. Those are made of one cell. Uh, Madison, yes, there are some animals that are made of only one cell. Yep. Um, they, they would be unicellular animals like the amoeba. Amoeba is considered an animal. Um, paramecium is considered an animal. Those are made of just one cell. They are unicellular. And as we get farther into our course, we will learn about those. We'll talk about the unicellular animals as well. Now, when something is really, really tiny, too small to be seen with just the unaided eye, you have to use a microscope to see it. What do you think that thing might be called? Something that you have to use a microscope to be able to see. Microscopular, I don't know. That's close. Abigail. Microscopic. They are microscopic, but there's a name for the organism itself. And the word organism is in there. It is a microorganism. This is the organism itself that is so small, we have to have a microscope to be able to see it. All right, there was a question somebody just asked me privately. Do plants have cells? What do you think? How many think yes? How many think no? Yeah, they do. All living things are made of cells, all of them. If something isn't made of cells, it's not alive. So plants have to be made of cells because they are living things. Now, we talked about this two times already. We've talked about this spontaneous generation. So scientists agreed that living things were made of cells. They kind of figured that out by looking at them under these microscopes. But they didn't know where those cells came from. Some of them thought they just spontaneously appeared from non-living matter. The theory that living things came from non-living things was this one, spontaneous generation. We talked about Francesco Reddy, his experiment where he put that gauze over the jar filled with meat. And then there was Louis Pasteur. He didn't think spontaneous generation was true either. So he did an experiment. I thought you might like to see a little, real short video about his experiment. So here it is. Pasteur added nutrient broth to flasks, bent the necks of the flasks into S shapes, and then boiled the broth to kill any existing microbes. After the broth had been sterilized, Pasteur broke off the swan necks from some of the flasks, exposing the nutrient broth within them to air from above. The remaining flasks were left intact. Over time, dust particles from the air fell into the broken flasks, but in the intact flasks, dust particles remained near the tip of the swan necks. They were unable to travel against gravity into the flasks. The broth in the broken flasks quickly became cloudy a sign that it teemed with microbial life. However, the broth in the unbroken flasks remained clear. Without the introduction of dust, on which microbes can travel, no life arose. Pasteur thus refuted the notion of spontaneous generation.
Okay, so here are the three parts of the cell theory. Now, over time, this theory was developed. It didn't come about right away. It took some time. So when we talk about a theory, a theory is a set of explanations about something. The um, It's well, usually well-tested, usually has been around for a long time, tested by a lot of people. Now, the cell theory tells us what cells are. And this is a really important theory in life science. So I want to make sure we understand what all these three things mean. So let's look at part one. All living things are composed of cells. So these two guys named Schleiden and Schwann, they discovered that all the parts of animals and plants are made of cells. Now, wait a minute. Can you guys think of any exceptions to that? Can you think of a living thing that is not made of cells? Hmm, Micah. Um, amoebas? Amoeba is one cell. It's a unicellular animal. Bastion. A rock. Rock is not living. Bacteria is a single cell. It is a unicellular being. These are good guesses though. What about viruses? Viruses are not made of cells. You guys think viruses are alive? Hmm. So there are some scientists who think that we need to rewrite this part of the cell theory in order to include viruses. We need to change it a little bit. But as of right now, all living things are composed of cells. Viruses are not composed of cells. Therefore, viruses are not living things. So when we, Cora, when we use the term germs, that could mean any kind of microorganism. It could mean a tiny little fungus. It could mean a bacteria, it could mean a virus, it could mean an archaea, which we'll learn about what that means too um, in our course. So it could mean any of these tiny microorganisms that can cause disease. And except for viruses, everything that we would put in the category of germs is a living thing. Viruses are not. Now, we mentioned before that there are a lot of different kinds of cells. Now that's part of the reason that it took scientists a long time to come to this conclusion that all living things are made of cells. Look how different all those cells are. Now, when you're a multicellular organism like we are, having all these different kinds of cells can be really helpful because they can specialize since there are many different types of cells in a multicellular organism like you, cells can become very good at what they do. So red blood cells carry oxygen. They get to be really good at carrying oxygen they don't have to worry about carrying messages to different parts of the body or carrying uh, or, or moving the body like muscle cells do. Um, here, neurons like this one right here, they carry messages. They don't have to worry about carrying oxygen or causing movement. Color, uh, epithelial cells like skin cells protect the body. So they get to be really good at protection. White blood cells fight against invaders. They don't carry oxygen. They focus on killing off the things that are not supposed to be in your body. Bone cells provide support. Muscle cells provide movement. But since there were so many different kinds of cells, it was a little bit confusing in the beginning when they first started saying, are things made of cells alive? Are, are, they, uh, are all living things composed of cells? So from the time of the ancient Romans, through the Middle Ages, really until the late 1800s, people believed in this idea of spontaneous generation. They thought life forms could come from other non-living things, especially something that was decaying. So for example, there was a recipe in the 17th century, this would be the 1600s, listen to this recipe. They said, if you wanted to have mice, if you wanted to produce mice, you should place some sweaty underwear and husks of wheat in a jar for about 21 days. During that time, the sweat from the underwear would soak into the wheat and change that wheat into mice. That was a real recipe in the 16th, uh, 17th century. Now that seems silly to us today. We know how the mice came about, right? 
they found their way to the wheat and went into the jar. But at the time, people believed it. They thought that was what was true until our friend Francisco, Francesco Reddy came along. And he did this experiment where he really attacked the idea of spontaneous generation. But do you think that that put an end to it? Do you think Reddy and Pasteur's experiments put an end to the idea of spontaneous generation immediately? No, it did not. So people continued to believe the idea of spontaneous generation for a while. Well, what about the invention of the microscope? Do you think that once they could see these tiny things under the microscope, they stopped believing in spontaneous generation? Nope. Not even then. They didn't. Actually, it made it worse. Microscopes revealed this whole new world of things that seemed like they just appeared out of nowhere. So they started calling these little organisms animalcules. And they um, what they noticed was that all you needed to do was put some hay in water and wait for a couple of days, and you could see these animalcules under your microscope. So they thought the animalcules were appearing from the hay. Now that debate about spontaneous generation really continued for a couple hundred years. Now we know it's not true. Now we know that as this, uh, this part here says, all cells are produced from other cells. That's the second part of the cell theory. Part one, all living things are made of cells. Part two, all cells come from other cells. Then we get to part three right here. Cells do what's needed to keep things alive. So think about all the things that are needed to keep you alive. What are they? Name some things that, that have to happen in order for you to stay alive. What kind of functions does your body have to do? Abigail. Drink water. Yep, you have to drink water. Can't, can't go without water for very long. In fact, you know, you can go about a month without food, but you can only go about three days without water and you'll die. Yeah. Uh, Mila. Um, either your heart or your brain has to like tell you to breathe. So it's your, it's your brain that's telling yeah, you to brain. breathe. <laughs> yeah. And it does it even without you thinking about it. Isn't that cool? The muscles that control breathing work without you thinking about it. Now they also can work while you're thinking about it. Like if I tell you, I'll take a deep breath. You can do that now. And now that we're talking about it, you're probably all thinking about your breathing. <laughs> you're aware of it, but you weren't a minute ago. It's totally unconscious. It is automatic. You're absolutely right about that. I'm going to ask you guys to hold your comments because I think I'm missing some questions. If I miss your question in the comment in the chat, um, please ask it again. Um, your heart has to pump blood, right? Exactly. You need to eat. Somebody said food. Bastion said food. Right. You need some shelter. Yep. Good, Bastion. Um, Howard says breathing. Yeah, very good. So we need a lot of different things. We've got to break down our food. Just eating the food isn't enough. You've got to break that food down into the tiny parts that it needs in order to build new things. We've also got to get rid of the waste products that our cells make. Our cells are hard at work. And just like a city makes a lot of garbage, just like your home makes a lot of garbage, the cell makes some garbage too that has to be taken away, that has to be removed. We have to fight against things that want to hurt us, either foreign cells from the outside or molecules that we might take in. You know, every time you take in some food, you're also taking in some harmful things as well that's on that food. Your body deals with it. It has to be able to do that. When something is broken or is cut or is damaged in some way, your living things have to be able to repair that damage. And they have to be able to make new cells over time. When you cut your finger, you have to make new cells to replace the places that were gone. Now, cells are the things that do all of that. That's what we mean when we say cells carry out the functions needed to support life. All of these things happen within a cell. Pretty cool. All, cell, all living things are made of cells. All cells come from other cells. Cells carry out the functions needed to support life. Those are the three parts of that really important cell theory. That's a good one to, uh, to keep in mind. Now, if we took all of the cells in the entire world and we put all of those cells into two different categories, one category is a kind of cell that has a nucleus 
and some organelles that have membranes on them. The other doesn't have a nucleus. Anybody remember what those two categories are called? You had them in week one. Rita. Vertebrates and invertebrates? Oh, so close, but no, that's the kind of animal. A vertebrate is an animal that has a backbone. An invertebrate is an animal that doesn't have a backbone. We'll start by learning about invertebrates in just a week or so. Any other guesses about these words? You guys remember these words? Eukaryote versus prokaryote. So these are the two kinds of cells that you find in living things. So a cell that doesn't have a nucleus is called a prokaryotic cell. Prokaryotes are the organisms that have prokaryotic cells. Eukaryotes are organisms that have eukaryotic cells. So a cell that doesn't have a nucleus, no nucleus or organelles is called prokaryote. One that does, it has a nucleus and it has membrane bound organelles is called a eukaryotic cell. Now you can remember that if you remember that you are a eukaryote. You are a eukaryote. That's a way that you can remember which is which. So let's look closely at the eukaryotic cell. So uh, the first lesson that you guys had, the one yesterday, that was about the organelles inside a cell. Eukaryotic cells are the kind of cells that have those organelles inside them. So this is what we call a typical animal cell. Now, typical, huh, that's pretty funny because remember back this picture here? Yeah, a lot of different shapes of cells, aren't they? They're all not, not all round like this typical cell that we have, but we have to study them. They're, they all are pretty similar. Even that really long neuron, it still has this part right here. It has this cell body that looks a lot like that picture we just looked at. And then this long axon is, um, it doesn't, it, it has some of the organelles in it, but they, they are, they're similar, but there are some differences. Just for this one, Take a look at all this stuff that's inside. And that's not even all of it. So when we see pictures like this, it makes it look like, okay, this is what we call a mitochondria that makes energy for the cell. How many of them are there in this cell? One, two, three, four. There's a lot more than that. A lot more than just four in a cell. So they, we just draw it that way because you know to draw a hundred of them would be a little cumbersome. This is what a typical plant cell looks like. We're not gonna to spend too much time with plant cells now. They're second semester when we start talking about botany. We'll talk a lot about plant cells, but just remember they are a eukaryotic cell because they have a nucleus and they have membrane bound organelles. All right, let's take a look at a cell, at some of the things that a cell needs in order to survive. So. A cell needs a barrier to keep things in and to keep things out. And the basic function of that barrier is to protect the cell from its surroundings. So think about your home. Think about your house. What part of your house kind of works a little bit like a cell membrane? My, Mila. Like the actual walls that has to be built. Yep. What What do the walls have to have in them to let things in and out? A solid wall. If all the walls in your house were solid, nothing could get in, nothing could come out. Wouldn't be long until the living things inside there started having trouble. Yeah, JR, a door. Daniel, good. A wall, a doorway, Jaslyn, good. So you've got to have doors and windows in your walls in order to let some things come in and some things come out. So if you think of the walls with the doors and the windows, that's a pretty good idea of a cell membrane. So an elephant can't come through your door. Some things are kept out, but a mosquito can, sadly. Mosquitoes can come right through the door. So just like the door lets some things in, but not everything, the cell membrane lets some things in, but not everything. So it acts as an outer boundary, controlling what comes in and what comes out. This is a picture of the cell membrane. It is such a cool structure. Yeah, it is like a passageway. So some things can just go right through the cell membrane, right through here. Other things have to go through these special channels in order to get in. Now, now 
Cells have a couple of different ways that they can bring things inside. Uh, sometimes they things just pass through. Sometimes things have to be carried in by a membrane like this. Um, a little pocket forms in the membrane and brings things inside. But there are ways that a cell brings things in and a ways that cells take things out. Now, I want you guys to watch this short video about the structure of a cell membrane. They use the term plasma membrane. Just remember it's the same thing. A plasma membrane and a cell membrane are the same thing. Between the living machinery of the inner cell and the harsh conditions of the outside world stands the cell's plasma membrane. As crucial as this barrier is, it's surprisingly flexible. Push it and watch it move. Poke hard enough and it might break and begin to regroup. The lipid molecules of the membrane naturally assemble in a double layer because their tails repel water as their heads attract it. Every one of your cells has a membrane like that. It can reconstruct itself if it's broken a little bit. If it gets to be too badly damaged, no, then it has to be replaced. But they are all made of that special double layer membrane with the water loving parts on the outside and the water hating parts on the inside. That's why some things can pass through, but not other things. And it isn't just the cell itself that has this really cool plasma membrane. The organelles have those membranes too. Remember this picture, this video here that I showed, or uh, animation? Once this is inside, it's called an organelle. This is a little vesicle. It's got the same exact membrane because it came from this one. Some organelles want to fuse with the membrane and send, the, send things to the outside. So all of your organelles, except your ribosomes and your centrioles. So you can see the central, where are the centrioles? Part of the cytoskeleton and the centriole isn't really shown here. Um, in this picture, but all the rest of these organelles have the same exact kind of membrane. Now, again, we'll talk about plants when we get to plants. Plants have a special outer layer on the outside called a cell wall. Bacteria have them too, but um, animals don't. You guys might've noticed that when you touch a plant, the leaf of a plant feels a lot, a lot firmer than your hand. You know, your skin feels really soft and flexible where a plant doesn't, it feels more firm. That's because of that cell wall. The cell wall gives it strength and support. And what's really cool about the cell wall in a plant is that it's colorless. It is completely clear. That allows light to get through because we'll learn that these little structures inside a plant are what performs photosynthesis. You've probably all heard of photosynthesis before. That is the process that plants use in order to produce food. All right, so we've got the cell membrane on the outside, sometimes called plasma membrane. On the inside, you've got this semi-fluid called cytosol and all the organelles. So the cytosol is the fluid. It's kind of the consistency of honey and it holds all the organelles in place. And then you've got all the organelles themselves. The cytosol plus the organelles is what we call the cytoplasm. Cytoplasm uh, the cytosol itself, the liquid is mostly water. It has some chemicals dissolved in it that give it that thickening effect. All right, now let's talk about the organelles. Now there's a lot of them. There's a lot of different kinds of organelles. We don't learn them all for our course. We'll learn about the most important ones, starting with, of course, the boss of the whole thing. Somebody has to be in charge of this cell and that somebody is the nucleus. You can think of the nucleus as a control center. What, which, which kind of cell has a nucleus? Prokaryote or eukaryote? You are a eukaryote. Your cells have a nucleus. It is a eukaryote right there is a cell that has a nucleus in it. And here are the things that the nucleus does. It's the control center because the reason it's the control center is that it has the genetic material, the DNA. The DNA is the instructions for all the things that the cell has to do, all of it. The DNA gives you the instructions. So all those eukaryotic cells have a nucleus. And then of course, the eukaryotic cells also have these organelles. The nucleus is the biggest organelle, but there's a lot more. One of the more important ones is the one that gives energy. So picture this guy. He is the mighty mitochondria, the energy producer for the cell, the powerhouse of the cell. Picture the mitochondria making a muscle. 
giving the energy that the cell needs. So the main role of these mighty mitochondria is to take the food that you eat and turn them into energy because plants have a lot of energy in them. Animals that, ha that have eaten the plants also have a lot of energy in them, but it's not in a form that you can use. Living things can't directly use the energy that's in plants. They have to convert it into something that is a, a better storage, um, storage unit for that energy. That something is called ATP. Anybody heard of ATP before? Anybody know what ATP stands for? It stands for adenosine triphosphate. We'll get to know ATP really well because ATP is the energy molecule used by all living things on planet Earth. That's a pretty important one, wouldn't you say? Yeah. So the energy has to be made in something. It's made in, for the most part, the mitochondria. Well, what about bacteria? They don't have any mitochondria. They actually can make that energy. They can make that ATP in their cell, their cell membrane. But we'll talk about those when we get to talking about the um, bacteria later in the year. So cells that have a lot of energy needs have a lot of mitochondria. Think about a muscle. Think about how much energy your muscles need in order to keep you moving through the day. Take a guess. How many mitochondria do you, do you think there are inside? Oh, let's take a heart muscle cell. Your heart is made of a special kind of muscle called cardiac muscle. Your heart has to beat about once a second for your entire life. Sometimes a little bit faster than that. But take a guess how many mitochondria one heart cell would have. Okay, guess realistically. <laughs> Nine cabillion is not, <laughs> yeah, lots. It's actually about 5,000. There's about 5,000. So remember that picture that I showed you? And I said, let me get that picture again. And I said that this, that typical cell shows just like these four mitochondria. That's kind of what they look like. There's actually about 5,000 of them inside one muscle heart, heart muscle cell. And depending on what the cell is, there could be a lot, uh, a lot few, there could be more or fewer than those. All right, next we have, how's that for a name of an organelle? Who named that? <laughs> endoplasmic reticulum. So this you can think of the endoplasmic reticulum. Sometimes we just call it the ER for short. So the ER is like a highway in a cell. It carries things around. So things that are made in one part of the cell have to be taken to another part. A lot of times that happens on the endoplasmic reticulum. There's two kinds. One has these dots on it and one kind does not. Rough ER has these ribosomal dots. Smooth ER does not. Okay, so what are the ribosomes? Well, they're another really important organelle in a cell. They make protein. So here's what I'm going to tell you. Proteins do almost all the jobs of a cell. Remember that the cell is the unit of structure. It does all of the jobs of a living thing. Proteins do the jobs of a cell. Gives you an idea how important proteins are. That should give you an idea how important ribosomes are. You have to have ribosomes in order to make protein. We'll learn about that later. So you can find them in a couple different places. There's, there's thousands of ribosomes all around every cell. Some of them are on the rough ER. Some of them are just loose floating in the cell. And here's another one, Golgi apparatus, sometimes called Golgi body or Golgi complex. This one was named after the guy who discovered them. His last name was Golgi. So he named him after himself. So maybe someday you can discover something inside a cell and name it after yourself. That'd be pretty fun. So they are like the post office of the cell. They package up the protein that's made by the ribosomes and then take it to other parts of the cell. Now, sometimes we need to break things down, like when a protein comes into the cell or a carbohydrate comes into the cell, it has to be broken down into smaller parts to be able to be used. That is the, um, the lysosome is what does that. The lysosome also takes away some of the waste products. The lysosome is filled with enzymes that are so destructive that if the lysosome broke, the cell would die, the cell would break down. 
And then we have vacuoles. This is the last really important one that we're going to talk about today. These are the vacuoles and tiny ones are called vesicles and they carry things around. I, this is not true. I got to change that. They're not found only in plants. We do have vacuoles in animals as well. So just as we leave, because class is over now, remember that eukaryotes have eukaryotic cells and prokaryotes are the ones that are, they are um, the like the bacteria that they do not have a nucleus. All right. Anybody have any questions about any of this today? Not really. All right. Have a great day and I will see you next week. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you. At the gym. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>